Good morning to everybody. It's good to see you. Good to hear you too. That's that's a good thing. We're glad glad you're here. Um, also glad for all the folks that continue to join us online. I didn't know how Leon did this or Cindy perhaps whoever, but I had Vicky check yesterday just to see how how our response to our online offerings have been as far as our services and the videos. And didn't you say 400 and something for, I don't know if it's last Sunday or the Sunday before or whatever, but so there is a lot of folks that still join us online. That obviously is a viable ministry and we are ministering to folks. So we do welcome all of those here as well. Uh, Deacon election and the House of Pearls voting will be held at the end of the prayer time here in just a few minutes today. Uh, the lake trip, which uh, if I'm right is Thursday or Friday and I don't see Holly, but the seventh. Okay, very good. So they would like the sign up for that to, to be today because Holly's going to order food and things, I think, for that. So if you want to go to the lake at Irvin and Diane's house on the 7th, which, yes, I guess would be Thursday, then please get signed up today. Tuesday, of course, is a big day for our nation, both nationwide all the way down to our local government and politics. So if you have not voted, be sure to remember to go by and vote on, on Tuesday. Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock, the Second Harvest Food Truck will be here to bring the shipment of food that will be given to the needy in our area. And Baxter sort of oversees that on those days, but he does need help for sure. So if you can come Wednesday morning, actually a little earlier than 8, he said would be good, but if you can come Wednesday morning, that would be great. Now, also, there may be some that, that choose not to come because maybe you don't think physically you're able to, to help move the boxes and pick up things and all that. But it's been a practice for a, a number of years that we also give out Bibles on that day to the, to the recipients that come by. So even if you're not able to physically lift and carry things, that would be a good ministry. The Bibles are here. Uh, Sherry's ordered them and got them in. And that would be a great ministry if you'd like to be a part of that, to come and do that while others are, are doing the food distribution. That would be great. Uh, in the bulletin, you will see that there continues to be a need for, for helpers and workers in the, in the nursery and in the children's um, uh, services at the, you know, during the worship service in here. So if you can volunteer for those uh, opportunities of service, if you'd please see Julia, that would be, that would be great. Payment for the Christmas show is uh, due next Sunday, uh, and the amount's in the bulletin, and that slipped my mind, but if you're going, you know what that is. So if you can, next Sunday, if you will make those payments. Uh, Friday of this week, Freddie is going to be well, perhaps Thursday or Friday, Freddie will be going to deliver the Christmas, the Operation Christmas Child boxes that we have put together. So if anybody else wants to fill some boxes and bring them, that will be fine as long as maybe we can have them here by, say, Wednesday night. Then Thursday or Friday one, he's going to go deliver those. So if you'll just bring them in here, he'll come and get them and then take them as he has to go to Charlotte that day with his truck anyway, and he's gonna make that delivery for us. So if you'll keep that in mind. Um, next Sunday will be the day that we recognize and remember and honor our veterans. We'd like to invite you to be a part of that. Also, a week from tomorrow, which is actually Veterans Day, at 11 a.m., we will be having the dedication of the new Marshville Veterans Memorial Park down at Marshville and we would certainly love to invite everybody to come that you would like to it will be at 11 o'clock that time is is uh, uh, special for Veterans Day that's the day that the armistice uh, was signed in 1918 so it will be it will be a week from tomorrow 11 a.m. at the new Veterans Park location in Marshville, which if you've not been by to see it, is right across the street from the library. So
So if you can be a part of that, that would be great. Are there other announcements before we move on to our prayer request? Yeah. Yes, you did say that, didn't you? Come forward. All right. Addendum, okay. <laughs> proves how important Holly is it takes two people to do her job and we still didn't do it all correctly so and y'all remember to pray for Holly as well as Steve in fact there's a lot of folks that are sick and and they are two of a number right now so let's remember remember those oh I'm sorry I did not that's next Saturday night at six o'clock yes I'm that's right there is a gospel sing at Hamlet's Crossroads next Saturday night at six o'clock. And I wanted to make sure that I got his name correct. Kevin Spencer. Kevin Spencer, yes. He's coming to Hamilton's Crossroads next Saturday night, six o'clock. He's uh, a well-known country gospel singer who is a part of a well-known family of gospel singers. And that will be next Saturday night at six o'clock. Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, as we turn our mind to prayer requests today, I've got quite a list here. One of the things, in our bulletin, if you get a chance to look at the, the list of, the top list of prayer request needs in the bulletin, take a look, look at those and if there are some that needs to be added or if some needs to be removed or revised or any changes made, if you'll just mark your bulletin, leave it in Sherry's box back at her office or leave it in the basket and we'll get it to her or call and leave her a message that would be good if if there are any kind of changes or revisions that need to be made on that list a um, couple of uh, hospitalizations this week joe byram went to was taken to the hospital i believe it was on wednesday uh, did spend at least one night there as far as i know he came home on friday the doctors are changing some medicine to help him with some cardiac issues, but Joe is at home unless something's changed since the last that I that I heard. I uh, got a call from Sharon Knight uh, yesterday, Miss Francis's daughter. They took Miss Francis to the hospital by uh, ambulance yesterday uh, and was in some degree of distress at the time. But after running CAT scans and other tests, they don't believe anything major is wrong. And she did get to come home yesterday, but please remember Miss Francis um, in her needs at this time. Bubba Langston, Kathy did get some good results or, uh, from the testing that he was having done that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. So that there is some, some good results to that. Reverend Atkinson is at home resting, trying to regain strength to prepare for potential surgery but she is at her home, which is up in the Concord area, up Harrisburg area, up that way. Uh, I had mentioned that uh, Steve was has been sick, I guess, for seven or eight days now, I guess it's been, and Holly sounds like she's got something similar coming on with her. 
but remember Steve as he's uh, trying to get over that sickness. Um, would like to ask, and I mentioned earlier, that we all just pray for the results of the election so that whatever the results are would be God-honoring. If that occurs, everything will be good. So pray for our leaders, pray for the elections. Let's continue to remember Cindy Whitley, of course. Uh, she's happy that she's got family coming in from Florida to visit this week. So um, keep uh, continue to remember her and, and their family. I'm glad you mentioned the folks in Western North Carolina. We need to not forget them. Obviously, that's not days or weeks or even months in a lot of those cases. And we have raised up, I mean, we have sent up to this point $3,812. And if you would like to continue to do donate to that relief effort, we have envelopes ready for you. Um, continue to remember our homebound friends nursing home, hospitalization, rehab centers, the list that's in your bulletin is, as far as I know right now, is correct and current. And if you could drop a, a call, I mean drop a card or make a call to visit with those folks, that would be great. Um, is there other request that needs to come forward at this time? Steve. Yes, ma'am. This is Brandon. Brandon. A friend of Brenda's neighbor named Brandon, who evidently has quite a battle with cancer and does have young children. Let's remember that. Are there others? Yes, ma'am. Raylan is having a tonsillectomy Tuesday. Let's remember that him and their family at this time. So thank you. Others? Yes, ma'am. worker of Shelby's with a child born in distress but as of now the mother and the baby are okay but that she is in the NICU that the child is so. <coughs> all right others I realized last week I forgot to ask for unspoken request I apologize that I apologize for that but if there are unspoken requests at this time if you would like to show them by lifting hands I know God sees those needs. Thank you very much. Um, Marty is going to come and lead us in our morning pr prayer, which will include what we've spoken about, as well as the deacon election and the House of Pearls vote for this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all the answered prayers that we didn't make known here today, but you know. God, you have answered prayers. You have taken care of those people in the North Carolina mountains. Lord, you have taken care of us as a church, as a family. And God, we humbly bow and thank you for that. And Lord, you've heard our petitions this morning, God. It is long. It is long and we have a lot. But God, none of that surprises you. There's not a one on that list that you don't already know about, God. And Lord, today we ask, Lord, that you might touch and heal those bodies. Lord, that you might lift those spirits, Lord. Lord, we pray for this newborn baby, dear God, and the mother. Lord, that you might continue to be with them. Father, we pray for our church, Father, and the things, Lord, that we're searching as if for a new pastor. God, we pray for that, dear Lord. And God, as we go and have our voting for deacons today, dear Father, Lord, I pray, God, that you just knit our hearts together in unity and love. God, that we would vote according to your will, dear Father, and that you would be glorified. 
Lord, we just thank you for all that you've done today already. And God, we look forward, God, to the preaching of your word. God, may souls be saved. May sinners be drawn closer back to you, Father. And Lord, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, the deacons will come and pass out ballots. And if when, when you get it, you will see that there are two issues or two items on, the, on each ballot. The top one is the election of deacons. The bottom one is the vote for the House of Pearl. So there will be two places that, that you will need to mark your ballots. So we've got the ballots. We've got some pens up here close by, and they will be around to you momentarily. If you'll mark it, pass it back to the center, and then they will, they will pick it up. <coughs> Join with us as we continue our worship by singing, singing Praise Him, Praise Him, 227. <clears throat>
come front. Mr. Brannon is headed up your way. Good morning, good morning. How are we doing? Good, good. I saw some real cool costumes on Trunk or Tree. That was, that was nice. Everyone have a good Halloween? Yes. Good, good, good. You did? All y'all looked good, man. It was really fun. Um, today we're going to talk about partner, partnering. We're going to talk about two things or things that are better together. Hey, mommy, mommy. So we're going to talk about partnering, things that go together. I'm going to show you some things, and I want you to say the first thing you think of, okay? That, that, what, what, partners, what partners with this? What goes with? Eggs. 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 Oh. Bacon and sausage? Yeah, not, not a bad choice. Not a bad choice. All right. Bacon and eggs. I like it. I like it. All right. Cheese, 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 right, right. Mac rice? No, no, you can't pull that one off. No, 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 no. Uh, macaroni and cheese. That's right. They go so good together. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Easy one. Peanut butter and jelly. That's strawberry jelly. Yeah, strawberry jelly is better actually. <laughs> hey, did you? What kind of peanut butter do you like? Creamy or crunchy? Crunch, crunchy, crunchy is my go-to. Crunchy is crunchy. What's that? That's who makes it. That's that's just the like Welch's makes this. It's just the manufacturer of it. But so we we're gonna think about things that partner together. So what I want us to do is we're gonna be we're gonna be prayer partners, okay? Because in this world. Like Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says, for two are better than one because their labor is great in return. If one falls, the other will lift him up. We are Christians, okay? We love each other. We need to pray. So I'm just going to let us take a moment in your mind. I want you to think about one person that you want to pray for. Family, friends, lost people, sick people. Just don't, you have to say it. Just think about it before we pray, and we're going to be prayer partners, okay, for a week. I want you to think in your mind really hard about someone you want to pray for, okay? Everyone got theirs? You got family, family? Okay, okay. You're not supposed to say it. Okay. <laughs> family, family, okay. Well, everyone pray for your family. But I want you to understand that we are, we are better as Christians together. When we partner together, we're like macaroni and cheese. We're like bacon and eggs. We're like peanut butter and jelly, okay? We partner together. We're stronger. We're better. Thank you for your attention, okay? Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our Father, thank you so much that you provide this house, Lord. You provide the, the living word for us. You provide these children's hearts. You provide so many resources for us to worship you, Lord. You're such a great God. Thank you for giving us so many things outside of our, our blessing, outside of our our earnings, Lord. I pray that you'll be with these children. Let them understand that the power of prayer, the power of partnering together, and Lord, that as Christians, that we could collect together to make um, to make your name the highest of high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Stand as we sing, continue our worship by singing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, hymn number 15.
There's no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. He mentioned about a song that he had been listening to recently that, that sent him a message. Well, I had one of those things happen this morning. Um, I was back in the office writing my book that I have so I don't forget everything from up here. And I had looked in, I was looking at my Bible and I had, like a lot of us probably do, I had used a bulletin as a place marker for a verse I was using in Sunday school. I know now it's been a number of weeks ago, but I didn't remember leave, leaving that in there. So I just pulled it out and was looking at it, and it happened to be the last Sunday that Preacher Leon was with us. And the title of his message that morning was, I Must Do Something for Jesus. So sometimes we get these messages when we need them. So thank you, Mike. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you. I was greeted. We were greeted when we walked in, Sherry and I, and I was asked if I was <laughs> going to be on good behavior today. Uh, maybe. <laughs> no, she's here. She uh, sternly rebuked me uh, when she heard the message from last time. So I apologize to the church family for anything I might have said. Uh, no, she made me say that. I'm just kidding. It's good to be here. Uh, God is good, isn't he? Yeah. I was just sitting, and I, I don't know what you were thinking about as, as the whole service was going on. Uh, crying babies, children, talking, means the church is alive. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's good to be here. Thank you for allowing us to be here. George Barna, in his uh, American Worldview Inventory last year, 2023, from Arizona Christian University, published uh, some reports on the seven cornerstones of a biblical worldview. Uh, I share them with you this morning as just simply an introduction to our text today. He said, according to the study, a biblical worldview, a corner, the cornerstones 
of a biblical worldview is number one, an orthodox biblical understanding of God. Number two, that all human beings are sinful by nature and every choice we make has moral considerations and consequences. Number three, knowing Jesus Christ is the only means to salvation through our confession of sin and reliance on his forgiveness. He goes on and says, number four, the entire Bible is true, reliable, and relevant, making it the best moral guide for every person in all situations. Number five, absolute moral truth exists, and those truths are defined by God, described in the Bible, and are unchanging across time and cultures. Number six, the ultimate purpose of human life is to know, love, and serve God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. And number seven, success on earth is best understood as a consistent, obedient to God in thoughts, words, and actions. I appreciated reading those uh, when I uh, came across this, this study. Uh, what I found to be challenging and uh, thought-provoking was when they went deeper into how American adults fare on each of these cornerstones, it gave me pause. Most of these numbers are very low. It said only 50% of American adults embrace the true nature of God. Only 27% recognize humans as sinful. 35% believe Jesus is the only way for salvation. Only 35%, one in three. 46% accept the Bible is true and reliable. 25% believe in absolute truth that's rooted in scripture. 36% see their purpose as serving God. And only 23% define success as obedience to God. That's a sad description of where we are in America. I would submit to you, if you haven't voted, you need to vote. Pray and ask the Lord for guidance on that. We are at a crossroads, not politically, but we're, we're at a crossroads, I believe, spiritually in our country. Our world and our country, our, our, our citizens, our families, us as individuals. The question we ask perhaps this morning is, are we abandoning God or are we abiding in him? If you have your Bibles, please join me. Uh, I want to pick up where I left off with you uh, our last time together for, in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read down through verse 29. The scripture says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have written to you because you do not know, you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and the no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you've heard from the beginning. If what you've heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, 
that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we've gathered as you've instructed, Lord, to sing praises to you. You are indeed worthy. Lord, thank you for this church that reaches out to those who are hurting and struggling, particularly in the western part of the county, the state. Lord, we pray that as we open your word, that you would come and you would dwell among us, that you would speak to us and challenge us, Lord, that we might be more like you. Lord, we pray for our country. Lord, you're not surprised by anything. You already know what's going to happen, and you're not rattled. Lord, help us to have your mind. Help us to trust you, that you're on the throne. And Lord, what we do here today, we pray, makes you smile. It brings glory and honor to you. We pray that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. It is with tenderness, this aged old minister, John, Right, somewhere around 90 to 95 A.D., he is probably in his 80s, and he calls them little children. He is writing to believers, and his heart uh, is, is their welfare, and he offers three reminders, if you will. The first one we find here is a declaration of the days ahead. It's a declaration of the days ahead in which they live, and by extension, it's a declaration of the days ahead in which we live. He says to them, little children, it's the last hour. And as you've heard, that the Antichrist is coming. He says, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have stayed. They would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. The scripture says clearly here that believers know it's the last hour. We're in that period. I don't know where you're at. But I truly believe we're living in the last days. I believe that with all my heart. I am not one who's going to stick my head in the sand, who's not going to keep my eyes down here on this earth and just trudge through life without focusing on what the scripture says. And our text this morning, as we just continue with what we've already shared from our last time together, says it is the last hour. Now, he's obviously reminding his leaders that the, his readers that the Antichrist is coming. Indeed, the the person of the Antichrist who in the end of days is going to come onto the scene and is going to wreak all kinds of havoc. I, I want to pause just for a moment and, and say that uh, pay attention to what's going on in Israel. This idea that the Antichrist is coming, uh, he's coming and he's going to come to Israel. There is going to be a temple standing in the last days, and we know this period of time called the, the tribulation, halfway through that, the scripture says that the Antichrist is going to come up and it's going to, three and a half years, the abomination of desolation, and is going to desecrate the temple. Pay attention to what's happening in Israel. But it also says, not only the person of the Antichrist, but also says that many, many antichrists, plural, have come and will continue to come. And because of this, we know we live in the last hour. I, I thought about that. Um, anybody ever been to the Ark out, is it Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana? Anybody, anybody ever been out to the Ark? Ken, Ken Ham, Answers in Genesis Ministries. He spoke to, uh, in terms of biblical history, he came up with what is called the, the seven C's. You, you perhaps know them. I, I will share them with you. He, he begins with, you know, biblical history, creation, obviously, that, that God created. 
And then he says the next thing we kind of see in the scriptures is this, this great corruption that man had sinned, uh, messed it up. Uh, we even know from, from that point that, you know, the, the scriptures tell us in Genesis that, yeah, yeah, you're going to uh, bruise him on the heel, but he's going to crush you on the head, pointing to the Savior, the Messiah that's coming. But moves on in scripture. The next big thing that we see is this catastrophe, this worldwide flood where only Noah and uh, his family were and wives were, were there uh, protected. And after the flood subsided, we, we see that uh, they were supposed to spread out throughout all of the world. And uh, we know uh, this next scene uh, where confusion took place because man decided that they were going to build this great big uh, tower, the Tower of Babel. And God said, oh, no, no, you're not going to do that. And he confused their languages and spread them all out through the world. And just as he was pointing in Genesis there, pointing to the Christ, it was the, the prophets who kept talking about and preaching that one day the Messiah would come. And uh, that's what we have, Christ. That's the next big picture we have in biblical history. And then, of course, the cross. And he ends, he ends his um, seven seas, if you will, with the end of all things, consummation. And he's making the point, and I think it's perfect to, to say, and through all of that, through, through creation and, and corruption uh, and catastrophe and, and, and on confusion and on Christ and cross and then consummation, you know, he simply asks the question, where are we in terms of biblical history? Where are we? We're right between, we're right there at consummation. We're at the end. There's a whole lot more that's happened in the past than will be happening here in the future. That's applicable to our text today. Lifeway conducted a study where he asked pastors if they believe they were living in the end times. The vast majority of them said yes. Additionally, they agreed that the events that are happening now foreshadow that fact, and many believe that this generation will see the Lord's return in their lifetime. I hold this view as well. Dr. Ice and Dr. Timothy Demi, in their work, The Truth About the Signs of the Times, summarize it in this way. He said, the Bible provides detailed prophecy about the seven-year tribulation. In Revelation 4, 19, we have this, this framework, and a, a serious Bible student is able, with dozens of other passages, harmonize what's happening of the seven-year tribulation and piece together what's going on in our world is the setting of the stage for the end. Of course, and I'll be good, and uh, my wife is there looking at me right now making sure that I don't go off on a tangent, but I got to say, out of the some 23,000 plus Old Testament verses, 66, over 6,600 of them contain predictive material. Of the 7,900, almost 8,000 verses in the New Testament, over 1,700 contain predictive material. The translation to that is almost 27% of the scriptures contain predictive material, and it's simply too much to ignore. My question and I am humble when I ask this question, why aren't pastors preaching on this? At best, it's unfathomable, and at the worst, it's irresponsible. If I was going to have to go to the doctor, Brother Teddy, and the doctor came in, and they were going to have to, they were going to have to have heart surgery, And he said, now listen, I only, I only completed 75% of medical school. 25% of it I didn't, but I, we, can, we can figure it out as we go. I, that's silly, but I'm saying the same thing. Why are we ignoring 25% of the book? Why aren't we talking about it? Why aren't we teaching it? There, there it is. 
but we have to say a couple of quick little things. Dr. Mark Hitchcock, a prophet, prophecy expert, warns about sensationalism. Everything we read and everything we see on the, the news or on our phones, you know, is not a sign. We are, we are encouraged in 1 Peter 4 to, to stay self-controlled and sober-minded. I remember seeing a gas shortage some years ago, and people were fighting at the gas station for gas. Don't, don't, don't even get me started about COVID and the toilet paper thing. I'm, I'm not going to go there, but it was insane. Date setting is foolish. Sensationalism is foolish. But also just as foolish is prophetic, what's called prophetic agnosticism. How can we know? I don't really know. It's, it's too overwhelming. I mean, it's so confusing. You, how can we be sure what the Bible teaches about end time events? Well, I know how we aren't going to know for sure is when we ignore 25% of the book. I know that. Everything isn't a sign. But we need to pay attention. When the scripture says we are in the end, we need to listen to that. I was in class last year, and one of the, my students, is, uh, Dr. Mike, this came up in a passage, and they hijacked, at least for five minutes, part of the class, and asked, um, Dr. Mike, do you think we're living in the end times? And I said, yes. And then, of course, they said, well, how do you know this? And I said, well, I want to refer you back to your pastors and your youth pastors. I said, but let me just say this. Um, economically, we see the world pushing for cashless societies. We, we see this movement towards a single uh, monetary uh, unit. We, we see all of this globalism that's that's setting the stage for the one world uh, ruler, one world currency, one world economy. I said the second thing I would tell you students, culturally, we see morality being rewritten. Sexuality is being redefined. The family unit is being reshaped. We are departing from Christianity. Love is growing cold. Those holding to a biblical worldview, that is seeing the world through the lens of scripture, it's simply diminishing. It is foreshadowing a one world religion. Uh, Bill Gates um, just this week um, said in an interview, said what we need to do is establish a religion for everybody. Yeah, Bill Gates, the author of truth. Geopolitically, we see the Middle East conflicts, we see wars, we see coalitions, uh, countries forming that foreshadow the prophetic landscape of Scripture, where Israel, the Scripture says, will be a sore spot in the world in the end times. How do we know we're in the last hour? Well, the Scripture, our text this morning, says so. Just as Christ had his forerunners, the prophets, John the Baptist, the Antichrist also has his forerunners. The scripture says, for false Christ and false prophets will rise. The scripture says in 1 Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. We notice the force here in verse 18 of our text. We know it's the last hour. Little children, it is the last hour. Not it might be. It is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Mike, what, what are you driving at? I'm driving at the next verse that John just doesn't simply stop there. It's not just about the... Um, this, you know, a, a declaration of the day in which they live, but also in which we live. It's not simply looking at Ken Ham's seven seas of biblical history and understanding that, you know, cr creation and corruption and, 
and all of this all the way down, we are right there at consummation. I had one man in church one time, I was doing an end time study, and he said, oh, this, is hap- this stuff happens all the time. I've heard this for years. Yeah, my grandpa told me, he was all big into grandpa. Well, this man was old, 70 himself. I said, well, your grandpa, that was before Israel became a nation in 1948. The clock is ticking. He goes, oh, that's a good point. I never thought of it. People aren't thinking about it because they're not studying it. And we have to be. We can't ignore 25% of the book. So I, I take a moment and I pause there to simply say, we are in the last hour. Verse 19, they went out from us because they weren't from us. Notice the origin of these antichrists. Okay, not the the antichrist, antichrists. Notice their origins. Where do they come from? (laughs) Within the church, how about that? They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they were not... Uh, they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Paul shares to the church at Corinth, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, tramming, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Peter, in the same way, writes, but they were also false prophets among the people, even as they were false teachers among you, who secretly bring in destructive heresies. The spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. So many are... Antichrist are are rejecting, uh, denying the deity of Christ, his his sinlessness, his death, his resurrection, his his lordship, and yes, his return. There are many modern examples. Perhaps you know the the name Alan Kordek uh, and the Fox sisters were raised in a in a good Christian home, but their efforts now have led over 13 million people into what is known as spiritism. How about Joseph Smith? Raised in a Christian background but was greatly influenced by his grandfather who had a deep hatred for the institutionalized church. Apparently some slight in the past just made him bitter and as a result after experiencing some vision from the angel Moroni, we are told, Joseph Smith has led some 16 million people into what is known as Mormonism. It doesn't stop. Charles Taze Russell was raised in a strict Presbyterian home and church and now has led over 9 million people to what is known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mary Becker Udi raised in a strong Christian and Calvinistic home, departed and has led almost 450,000 into what is known as Christian scientists. There are so many examples of antichrists in our world. We live in a country right now where you know as well as I do that there is a, a battle about the identity of who we are as a people. we see a declaration of the days ahead. But the second thing I want you to see is a proclamation of protection. Verse 20, a proclamation of protection. But you have an anointing, the scripture says, from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. But who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He acknowledges, he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. I am not making this political. I am not interested in them coming and, and looking at Austin Grove's 5013C status. I'm not, I'm not. I'm just repeating what everybody else on the planet saw. One rally, somebody said, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, and one of the candidates said, that's right, Jesus is King. And then at another rally, some students cried out, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, and the candidate said, oh, oh, you're at the wrong rally, that one's at down the street. 
Mm. But yeah, that shouldn't matter, right? That shouldn't matter. Who is it that acknowledges that Jesus isn't king, Jesus isn't Lord? The spirit of Antichrist. That right there should make voting easy. God gives believers two protections, the Holy Spirit and his word. He gives unction here, it says. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 1, we says, Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. He has sealed us and given a spirit in our hearts. Jesus says in John 14, I will pray the Father to the Father, and he will give you another helper. Jesus in John 8 says, To those who believe him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There are many in, in our world, uh, in our culture, right up the street from us, who are training and um, retraining our young people to think the way they want. <clears throat> I won't mention the institution, uh, but I am going to mention this. The Department of Religious Studies will be hosting a talk. This is happening this coming February. The Department of Religious Studies will be hosting a talk by the religious studies scholar, Dr. Ken Stone from Chicago Theological Seminary. That's a red flag there. But anyway, our 40th name lecture. It will be Monday the 24th. The talk title is Loving Behemoth, Queer Animality, Eco-Spirituality, and Biblical Interpretation. And all of the religious studies majors have to go to that. <clears throat> but I'm going to be good. Those from after Christ ascended, death, burial, and resurrection, and ascended, gave the marching orders to the church. F from, from there... <laughs> The Antichrist unleashed an attack like never before. Okay, Jesus paid the price. He was successful and rose again from the dead. But I'm going to twist the minds and the thinking of these people. Questions of timing. No way, no way this is true. These events that are recorded in Scripture... These, these were recorded so many years after the actual events took place that what we have in here now is just a, a list of myths and, and fables. Questions of transcription. Maybe it was written within the eyewitness, uh, eyewitnesses lifespan, but what they wrote, what they transcribed, tr questions of transcription, they got it wrong. There's, there's errors and contradictions in the scriptures. Questions of trustworthiness. We can't trust those who wrote. Question of historicalness. These places that they're writing about, these people, they're, they're figments. Besides, Jesus probably wasn't even a real person, they say. Questions of archaeology. Archaeology continues, they say, to discredit the biblical timeline. And of course, questions of prophecy, fulfilled prophecy. Oh, that's just a result of random chance somehow happening. There is a battle going on, and unfortunately, sometimes the church, the church is asking the wrong, is trying to answer the wrong questions. They're asking questions of yesterday and, 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 and young people and, and what they're giving an attack to right now. They're, they're asking a whole set of different questions, and we have to be prepared to battle that. First, there's a declaration of the days ahead. But secondly, there's a proclamation of protection that we have this unction that's going to teach us truth. And finally, there is an appeal to abide 
in Christ. Beginning in verse 24. Therefore let that, that truth that you have, uh, the Holy Spirit, that this unction, this charisma living in you, which you've heard from the beginning. If what you've heard from the beginning abides in you, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has given us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who will try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. You do not need that anyone teach you, but at the same time, at the same anointing teach you concerning all things, and it is true, and it's not a lie. Just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Again, this word abide, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, again, coming back around to this idea, we're living in that end time, and he's come. When he appears, that we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices intentionally, deliberately, consciously righteousness is born of him. As we be, find a landing spot, I want to ask, when life squeezes you, when the enemy tempts you, when others try to corral you, when God wants to sift you, when others try to deceive you, how do you respond? In, in, in Matthew's uh, gospel, we are told in the fourth chapter, uh, Jesus was being tempted after 40 days and uh, 40 nights. He was led to be tempted. And the scripture uh, says, and the tempter came and said to him, if you're the son of God, command the stones to become bread. Remember what Jesus said? It is written. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, and placed him on the pinnacle, the highest point at the temple, and said to him, you know, look, if you are who you say you are, throw yourself off of this. And he, the devil said, he will give his angels charge over you. And Jesus said what? It is written. And then we are told that the enemy took him to the highest mountain, the peak, and said, um, all these kingdoms I give to you if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, it is written. How do we deal with adults who don't have a biblical worldview, who they tell us now that children by the age of 13 have their worldview mostly intact. School-aged children through high school are being raised and consuming large amounts of social media. The attacks upon Christians, the cultural darts that are being thrown to us the imp what are the implications to, to the church, to, to the home, to the school, to the government? How do we abide in what we know in him because we know it's the last hour? What do we do? What is, what is the answer? Four small thoughts. Consume, absorb, feast upon, meditate upon, read, clean God's word because it transforms our minds. Consume God's word. Stay connected with like-minded people. We need each other. Crave worship. You ever thought that we're not called to be spectators, but rather participants in worship? Because a spectator judges. I didn't like the song today. Did you see what he had on? Participants actively 
crave worship of the Savior. And lastly, communicate with him in prayer. What is the answer in this hour in which we live? Consume, stay connected, crave, communicate with the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your goodness to us. Lord, we hear your word that we are living in that last hour. Lord, we pray that as our culture, as our classrooms, as even so many of our churches are avoiding the truth that you are soon returning, Lord, might we individually begin with each of us individually cling to your word. Lord, we need each other. May we crave worship. May we continue to seek you and communicate with you in prayer. Lord, as we close this service, draw us to yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing how appropriate. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. As you sing, may we do just that. Turn our eyes upon Jesus. Let's sing.